Victor Villares, and I was recently appointed CTO of uh, Power America, and I'm also a professor at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Uh, just a brief introduction about myself. I received my PhD degree from Johns Hopkins University in 1995. Uh, I'm originally from Greece. I came to the U.S. for two years, and it's been 26. Um, as far as my work prior to Power America was with Northrop Grumman Corporation, which is a defense contractor, and I was working on silicon carbide devices. I did design, fabrication tests, looked at reliability, and the devices that I uh, worked on were JFETs, MOSFETs, I did some work on thyristors, uh, Schottky diodes, and uh, spin diodes. Okay, so uh, the outline of the talk is here. The first question we need to answer is why are we looking into silicon carbide? Uh, and the hint would be, you know, there's money to be made, right? If there's no financial incentive. You're not going to work on any of these things. So there have to be some compelling advantages uh, that will make people make the devices and, and try to basically take market share from silicon, which is pretty much everywhere and it's a big enemy, so to speak. Um, then we'll talk about uh, some silicon carbide devices, give some information of those. I don't think we'll have time to get to the edge termination, which is a very important concept, and I don't think we'll have time to get to the device design and fabrication. So we'll cover as much as we can. Please feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay, so going back, back into the question, why are we looking into silicon carbide? What's the compelling advantage that this material brings? If you look at the material properties, and I'm putting GAN there as well, since we're working on wide band gap devices in general here at uh, Power America, uh, the thing to notice is that the energy gap is a lot higher than that of silicon. It's about three times that of silicon, okay? And then the critical electric field is about 10 times higher than silicon. It's got much better thermal conductivity, okay? So these are the compelling material properties that you need to exploit to make successful devices and then uh, basically displace silicon in certain areas, right? Not everywhere. So what does wide band gap mean? Wide band gap means so silicon has a smaller band gap, silicon carbide has a wide band gap. Uh, that means that you can operate at high temperature, right? A semiconductor stops operating as, you know, as soon as the intrinsic carrier density goes up with temperature to the point where you cannot have doped areas, right? So the fact that you have a much wider band gap in silicon carbide means you can be at much higher temperature before you reach that level. So the intrinsic carrier concentration at room temperature is very, very low due to the wide band gap. You don't get carriers excited thermally uh, due to the large gap. Um, so that also means you can work in radiation hard environments, right? Uh, like in space, and that's why NASA is looking at this material. The large critical electric field, which is shown here, 10 times that of silicon, means you can operate at very high voltages with very low resistance. And that's the key, right? You have low resistance, that means you have low losses when you do your high voltage operation. And also the fact that you make it smaller means you have uh, less, of a, less of an area for the carriers to move, so it becomes a lot faster as a, as a device. Um, large thermal conductivity, what does that mean? That means you're able to dissipate the heat more efficiently, right? And that's very, very important because then you relax the cooling requirements. And the large saturation velocity means you can operate at high frequency. So in, in theory, silicon carbide devices can operate to 1,000 degrees before you start seeing the interesting carrier concentration going up to the point uh, where it becomes, it becomes an issue. And just to give you an idea, because this is the major selling point, the resistance is basically dependent to the third power on the critical field, right? So if your critical field compared to the to, to silicon that you're uh, basically comparing with, if it's 10 times and then you have it to the third, that means that the resistance can be a thousand times lower, okay? Ideally, in an ideal device. So what I want you to get out of this slide is that, is that you have low resistance at high voltage, Okay, and that you're able to operate at high temperatures. And we'll look at some examples. Okay, so where, where are the applications? If you look into the commercial world, right, you have all these hybrid electric uh, vehicles 
in all electric vehicles, right? They have um, power conditioning, they have power semiconductors, and you can insert silicon carbide there. And, and companies like um, Honda and Toyota have their own fabrication where they make these devices for their for their cars, right? Because uh, you have lower losses and you relax the cooling requirements. And then in anything that has to do with renewable energy, you know, inverters, converters, uh, photovoltaics, um, you know, just regenerative power in, in general. And it's those large scale applications that, you know, silicon carbide is going after because those will create the manufacturing volumes that will reduce the prices. In addition, there are smaller military applications and that's, you know, part of my DOD background, um, the Army wants to have hybrid and electric vehicles, right? They want to have hybrid uh, Humvees, hybrid tanks. If you go into electric mode, you're not generating heat, heat-seeking missiles won't be able to strike. At the same time, in electric mode, you're very, very quiet. So stealth is an important parameter. Now, the biggest selling point, of course, is the, is the high temperature capability, right? You, you have a cooling system for your, for your power. If for some reason a projectile hits that cooling system and it goes down, it's going to take much longer for the silicon carbide parts to melt without cooling compared to silicon. That, that means you might be able to get away from the fire zone just enough you know, to avoid catastrophe. Okay. Uh, another application is for pulse power systems that's very high voltage. Uh, it's the electromagnetic railgun. So now you're going to have a projectile that's going to be accelerated by an electromagnetic field as opposed to ammunition. And that means you can have a ship without ammunition and that's a big advantage. You get hit by a torpedo. It doesn't strike like a magazine area where the whole ship can, you know, basically uh, have a massive explosion. And the principle is, you know, it goes back to that, um, you know, you got to have a current, uh, an electric field and a magnetic field, and then, you know, you're going to have a force accelerating the metal, right? But you need very, very, very high levels of current. So you have a big capacitor bank, and you need to make a switch that will hold that capacitor back in the off position. And then when you turn it on, you let that, the capacitors discharge, creating the, um, you know, the current that will create the electromagnetic force. And another application that you see here is the active armor. So you take a military vehicle and you put tiles everywhere. And as you see a projectile approaching, you sense that, and a tile gets injected to meet it halfway. So the energy of the projectile gets dissipated before it actually hits the, the vehicle, so it will not penetrate. Okay? So there are some compelling applications. Will this DOD applications uh, basically fuel the growth? No. The DOD came in, did some of the initial um, financing, made sure the technology got started. It's the commercial applications that will create the volume. And in the process, um, you know, some of the DOD applications will also uh, benefit, which, you know, some of these applications can, you know, save lives. So it's a very, very good thing. Okay, just a brief slide on what we do at Power America in case you're not familiar with our work. So we want to basically create energy savings through the accelerated adoption of wide band gap semiconductor devices. Okay, so we try to promote uh, wide band gap devices. As with any new technology, the price is very high at the beginning. If you basically find an area of application and the demand grows, then the manufacturing volume goes up and prices drop. You know, sort of what you saw with the flat panel displays, right? Uh, back in 1996, the flat panel monitor of 19 inches was about $14,000, you know, versus $300 for that big CRT monitor. Um, not so anymore, right? You got the volume to the point where prices uh, came down substantially. So how do you get people to use wide band, wide band gap semiconductor devices, right? Why would they displace silicon, okay? The first thing you need to show is that you have performance advantages, right? Somebody comes in, you tell them you can do high voltage, you can do high temperature, hopefully you'll have a demonstration to show that. and. He's convinced that this will work great in his application, right? So you got him interested. And this part for silicon carbide is more or less there. People are aware of the, of the, you know, the capabilities of the material. They're aware of the superior uh, capabilities versus uh, silicon. The next thing you want to do is establish reliability, right? Nobody will take a device from a new material, right, and put it into a system and run the risk of having that system go down. Okay, everybody has managers to report to, and you don't want to go back and say, well, you know, I use this new technology, and three years into 
it's life, it, uh, you know, it doesn't work anymore and we need to go in the field, it's a nightmare. So people are very reluctant and for good reason to introduce new type of devices, new types of materials, right? So you got to have a very compelling um, case with reliability, right? You got to show that it's reliable, you got to do accelerated aging. Uh, I think typically it's a 25 year window that these devices must uh, operate um, well in. So you got to do the type of testing that uh, will demonstrate that. Okay, so you show great advantages, you told them that it's reliable, the next thing is you got to give those devices so they can put them into their systems, right? And talk to their boss and say, here it is. Here are the actual, um, you know, savings, right? Here's what, how the system is going to benefit from these devices. So that's the system insertion part. So when you have all that and the people say, okay, this technology is really good, then the next thing they're going to tell you, it's like, you know, we'll wait until the prices go down to buy them, right? And that's where the problem is. So you got to keep the prices down. So that's where we come in. We take um, TRL 4 to 7, which is the technology readiness level, which means they've been demonstrated and they're ready for the next step going into uh, manufacturing. And we try to um, increase demand, get people to understand these devices, educate people, right? A lot of the power electronics people that can use these devices uh, don't know silicon carbide, don't know GAN, and they're reluctant, right? If they're trained engineers who understand these devices, worked on these devices in, in college, and then eventually find themselves in the industry, then, um, you know, there's no apprehension there, right? It's not like, oh my God, it's a new, new material, the gate drive has to be a little different, uh, you know, I'm going to stick with what I know. You're not going to get much of that, right? Um, so reducing costs means you got to get people to work with these devices and you got to get the manufacturing level up, you got to get the demand up and for that you need a trained workforce, you, know, you need people who are ready to put them into device modules and systems and that's where a lot of you come in, uh, you know, power electronics can be a very exciting field to work in and working with these new types of devices can be very interesting as well as bring uh, job stability down the road. Okay, just to give you some examples of the performance, which is what we started with, um, uh, Cree is, was the initial company, it, went, it became Wolfspeed, and now I think it's bought by Infineon. Uh, it's a North Carolina company, I think it was a startup from North Carolina State. And you can see that, they, that they've made this IGBT device, right, that can block 27.5 kV. So you have a single device capable of blocking, uh, you know, uh, 27,000 volts, right? And that's a great, great example of something that silicon cannot do efficiently, right? Silicon will have massive resistance. That's an area where silicon is not there. This is where you open up new applications because of this technology. Um, high temperature operation. Uh, silicon and then um, you have the cool MOS devices, you're at about 120 degrees, 125 most, right? Uh, this is a JPET that I built back in, I think it was 2006, and you can see uh, this is the room temperature current, and as the, as the temperature goes, goes up, you go from room temperature to 100 to 200 to 300 C. So you go to 300 degrees and it's still um, operating, okay? It's, it's this line right here. Okay, obviously as you increase the temperature, the resistance of the material will go up, right? That's physics, and your current will go down, but you're able to operate at that temperature. Now, what limited this device to 300 C is the metallization, right? You got the device, and then you have metal wires uh, soldered to packages, and when I went beyond 300, I started to see everything kind of melt like wet, and that's where I stopped, right? But there's no fundamental reason why you should stop there. Um, this slide is from my friends at NASA, and this is a silicon carbide JFET that they made. Uh, they operated for 10,000 hours, and the temperature was 500 C. Okay, so this is a very impressive result. It shows you the temperature capability. Okay, so we've shown high voltage operation and high temperature. The next thing is the reliability. Okay, this is some uh, work that I did in the past on, on, a, on a JFET. And basically what I did is a 1200 volt device, so I turned it on and off, right? Hard switching means that as the voltage goes down, it turns on at the same time. And you can see this point right here, you're at about a thousand volts, and your current is about 80 amps, okay? This is, this is the part right here where you have the maximum power, and this is where the device will fail if, if it's not robust, right? And uh, mind you, this device is meant to be at about 10 amps. 
So I was operating at about 13 times its rating. And I did this turn on, turn off for uh, 2.4 million times, right? It was a circuit, Texas Tech put it together, they put the device, turn it on and off, and you can see the device survive. These curves of the gray and the black are the before and after, okay? So it can be made reliable, and it's these types of demonstrations that obviously need to be in a larger scale to convince people that these devices can work well and to build confidence in them. Yes, please. Are you providing the university of the students to create and prototype so we can to design our application? So the devices that I use here were manufactured, fabricated, funded, tested for the U.S. Army, and after I completed the work, the U.S. Army took them. We do have a device bank that we're trying to work through the legal issues of setting up, and we'll have devices available for people. We also have a process that we're running at a fab, and through that process, we will make devices, and those devices will be made available um, you know, to, 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 to students uh, to put into circuits and, uh, and work on them. Uh, but that's, it's, it's in the stage of figuring out what the legal um, requirements are. But yes, to your question is there will be devices, or we're hoping there will be devices down the road for you to, for you to use. Okay, and as far as the system benefits are concerned, uh, this company, API, makes packages and modules. It was eventually acquired by Cree, so at this point it's part of Infineon. And what we have here is an inverter made out of silicon for five kilowatts. And a similar inverter but made in silicon carbide, okay? So the scale comparison uh, here, you can see this is much bigger. So when you look at volume, you can reduce volume by 85% by going to silicon carbide because uh, you're reducing a lot of the passives, you're easing the cooling requirements. Uh, mass reduction, 85% lower. Uh, you're able to operate at 250 for this particular module versus 125. And then you have a 25% uh, percent increase in efficiency, okay? So there are some huge, huge advantages at the system level, okay? So we showed the high voltage, high temperature performance. We showed that you can do reliability testing and show reliability, and here are the system advantages, right? So now the next step is get the price down, get the volume up, get people familiar with the devices, get people to use them, okay? All right. So this is not, of course, a marketing uh, type of uh, presentation. So the money part, yes. This is a circuit like which you showed right now. Yeah. So the SIC based, uh, this inverter is also like an IGBT based or a market based? It's as far as as far as I know, this is a IGBT based, and this one here is MOSFET. And the reason is. Uh, because of the high resistance of silicon, you go to IGBT to have the, you know, the, uh, the, the modulation, right, the minority carrier modulation. In silicon carbide, because the resistance is very low, you can go to very high voltages with a unipolar device, with a, you know, with a MOSFET. So that's actually a, a matter of debate. At what point in silicon carbide do you go from uh, MOSFETs to IGBTs? And it's probably in the 10 kV uh, range, and it will, of course, depend on your switching frequency, right? Because there's a trade off there. Okay, just to reiterate, um, this shows the resistance versus the blocking voltage, ideal curve. And you can see if you want to operate, you know, you know, at 11, 1200 volts, uh, here, a little over 1000, if you're using silicon carbide, your resistance is here. If you're using silicon, your resistance is much, much higher, okay? And this is the fu fundamental uh, properties of the, of the material. Okay, so let's look into the technology a little bit, talk about some of the uh, silicon carbide devices. Um, so the silicon carbide is available in many different product um, polytypes, okay? Uh, the 6H and the 4H, the hexagonal structures, are the most common, and 4H, Silicon carbide is, perf is preferable for power devices uh, because it's got a higher electron mobility, it's got lower intrinsic carrier concentration, and shallower dopant ionization energies. It's, uh, the silicon carbide has a silicon face and a carbon face, and most devices are made in the silicon face because you can get better uh, gate oxide uh, materials. And the, grow the, the crystals are grown uh, with their surface cut at 3 and 8. So the bull is cut at 3 and 8. The reason why you don't have a normal cut is because if you do an angle cut, then um, 
basically defects that are in the substrate will not propagate as effectively into your epitaxial layers where the device is made. Okay? So with any semiconductor material, you need to have a way to do the N-doping and the P-doping, right? So for silicon carbide, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are the N-dopants, and boron and aluminum are the P-dopants. Uh, another thing to make note of is that silicon carbide is an indirect band gap semiconductor, right? So you have conservation of energy and momentum, right? So yes, you can get light um, because the band gap will allow you to get some little, I don't know if you can see the little bluish light right here. Um, you can get light, uh, but not as efficiently as in a direct band gap semiconductor. And actually silicon carbide was one of the materials that was looked into uh, at the time when they were trying to do blue LEDs and blue lasers, and eventually, as we all know, GAN uh, basically prevailed. And let's look at the breakdown voltage, right? You want to build a device that's 1,000 volts, 10,000 volts. What do you need to do? What primarily determines um, what voltage range your device will work at? And it's basically the drift layer thickness, right? If, if you look at the thickness, which is denoted by W, um, the breakdown voltage is proportional to the thickness. So the thickness, you, the, the thicker you make the drift layer, the higher the voltage, okay? For example, if you have a drift layer, the thickness here of about 12 microns, uh, you can do an ideal of 2,200 volts. If you make the drift thickness 100 microns, then you can go to about 14,000 volts, okay? So the thicker you make the drift layer, the more, more voltage you can withstand. Obviously, the thicker the layer, the higher the resistance as well, right? These things go together. Um, so you can see for the 12 micron, it can be 5.7. When you get to the 100 micron, it's 104 from some, uh, from some devices, okay? So if you get to a very thick layer, right, um, you know, the resistance, as you can see here, is obviously proportional to the thickness. So if your layer becomes very, very thick and very resistive, that's the point where you want to say, I want to use, I want to operate a bipolar type of device to have both electron and hole uh, conductivity to reduce that resistance. Of course, the drawback there is when you switch the device, the fact that you have two types of carriers, right, means you also need to sweep away the minority carriers during the switching, so your switching will be slower. And slower switching means more lossy, right? So it's, it's always a trade-off between the conduction resistance and the switching resistance. And um, you can see here that also the doping of the layer uh, comes into play for the voltage and, and, and the resistance as well, right? So you can see the lower the doping, the higher the resistance you're going to have. So you do a design where you kind of calculate the thickness, you come up with a doping, optimize those for a specific voltage range. You know, if you want to do a 10,000 volt device, a 1,200 volt device, um, you know, these are the, these are the, the rules. Okay, so as far as the vertical and uh, horizontal type of, or lateral type of configuration, right? Um, this is a lateral device. You have source gate drain, lateral transistor, and this is a vertical device. This is a drain, this is a source, and these are the, the gates right here. So with this device here, current will flow from the drain to the source, and if you apply a gate voltage, you can close this corridor here where the current goes through and go into blocking mode, okay? A lateral device, however, everything is done in this lateral direction, okay? So the advantage of a lateral device, it's highly desirable, right? Because you can do system integration. You can have integrated circuits if it's lateral. If it's gonna be a vertical device, you can only do so much. It's kind of a monolithic uh, type of device, okay? So, Although this is preferred, by the time you get to really high voltages, right, in order to do high voltage, you have to separate the gate from the drain. The higher the voltage, the bigger the separation between gate and drain will be. Well, at some point, if you exceed 1,000 volts, then the distance between gate and drain becomes large enough that your device takes up too much area. If you look at a vertical device, however, right, because you have the vertical uh, separating 
you know, the gates to drain, then you don't increase the area. So the bottom line is lateral devices are desirable because they allow um, system integration, but by the time you get to the high voltages that, that you need for power electronics, they're impractical, right? So you go to the, um, to the vertical device. Remember, if you make a device and it takes a lot of area on a wafer, then the fewer devices you're going to get out of that wafer, so the more expensive it's going to be. Okay, so the next thing is the unipolar versus bipolar operation. Okay, in unipolar operation, you have one type of um, carrier, either an electron or, or a hole, um, and you can see here in this example of a MOSFET, you have drain to source movement of just electrons here. Okay, so in unipolar operation, you have one type of charge carrier, and that means you have high resistance. But the fact that you have one type of carrier means that when you do switching, you only need to get, you know, to switch uh, away one, one, one type of carrier, so that's going to be faster. So you have higher on state resistance, higher conduction losses, but very low switching losses. Now, when you get to a very high voltage, right, this drift region here will have a lot of resistance, right, because you need to make it very thick for high voltage. So then you go into bipolar operation. You have uh, electrons and holes flowing, and that reduces the overall resistance. Okay, but the drawback there is that when you try, you know, when you do your switching to go from on and off, you have two types of carriers that you need to sweep away, so it's slower. So what happens with bipolar uh, conduction? You have minority carriers, right, as well as uh, majority carriers, and. That means your conduction resistance is lower, but your switching uh, losses become higher, right? So you look at your voltage range, you know, what type of voltages you want to do, and at the same time, um, you look at your switching frequency, and then do some calculations and see whether you want to go with a unipolar device or a bipolar device. In silicon carbide, generally speaking, up to 10 kV, people typically use unipolar devices. They would use a MOSFET. Once you exceed 10 kV, then because you have um, you know, conduction losses being substantial due to the thick layer, to get you to 10, 15 kV, 20 kV, you go into bipolar um, type of uh, devices. Uh, so these are some of the devices that have been made in silicon carbide. Of course, there's the MOSFET, which is the, the, the most important, the primary device that people are, are looking at. Uh, the reason being they see it as a direct replacement of uh, silicon MOSFETs. Um, there's JFETs for more limited type of uh, applications, at least up to this uh, point. And then you have diodes. You have shot key diodes and, and JBS diodes. Okay, and I'll talk about that if time permits. And then you have only electron, because these are unipolar devices, so you have fast switching, right? Then you go into bipolar devices, which is the BJTs, thyristors, IGBTs, and the pin diodes. Okay, so now you have electron and hole flow. And in this case, the conduction losses are lower, uh, but you have slow switching, so your switching losses are higher. Okay, so these are the two types of devices, and you know, depending on your voltage range and depending on your switching frequency, you decide you know what device is best for your for your application. Okay, another thing about silicon carbide devices is the ESD immunity. Okay, um, if you look at silicon and even phosphide, when people make these devices, they wear all these straps, right, for ESD. Uh, silicon carbide devices, at least um, the JFEDs that I was handling for the most part, you can go up to 16 kV, no problem. Um, we never used any, you know, any ESD type of protection. The devices were just fine, okay, and that's because of the larger uh, band gap. You're, they're not you're not able to destroy them, so to speak, as as easily. Uh, testing now, testing is a very important thing, right? You want to test to 10 kV, and you know you have to set up um, a lab. You have to worry about safety. You need to have uh, mats for for isolation. Um, so what we did. Uh, you know, we would put a wafer, this is a finished wafer, it's got 10 kV type of devices, so it's being tested at 10 kV. 
there's an automating uh, we had an automated lab view program that would sweep the device stop at every device make the measurement and, and, and move on and the wafer was immersed in fluorine art right because if you leave the wafer in air and you come down with probes uh, you're going to get arcing and that's going to kill the device right so you need to put it either in some inert type of fluid or you know down the road when you package the device to sell you put some gel uh, for high voltage and of course high temperature so one way to test them uh, would be here with a uh, floor inert type of um, you know solution uh, the other way to do them, to, to test high voltage devices is to do it in vacuum. And this was a setup that they had at the Navy Research Lab that I would, uh, I would go to. And um, you create vacuum and therefore you can go to higher voltages without having that problem of arcing through, through the air. And I don't know how visible this is. This is the device that I was testing. And as I was increasing the voltage, I started to see like a little light right here right because it's a semiconductor um, that will emit in the blue and I knew this right here was a problem area so if you test in, in total darkness and in vacuum right you can actually see uh, light coming from areas where it shouldn't and that gives you a warning that there's something wrong with the device so the bottom line is you need special uh, there are special requirements for testing at these high voltages right you need to have a setup for for that the next thing is packaging, right? You can fabricate the wafer, you got the wafer, you test it, you dice it up, you get the little chips. The question is, how do you package them, right? And if you use silicon packaging, it's not there, okay? It's like having a Ferrari and being in New York City traffic, right? It's not, you're not gonna go any faster than anybody else, okay? Although you're gonna look good, that's for sure. But the silicon packaging will not work there's a lot of heat that's generating these devices and you want to be able to dissipate that heat so if you use silicon packaging there's kind of a bottleneck right you're not able to get that heat out so um, this is a 1200 volt wafer uh, this is the devices I was that, that I cut off this is just a makeshift type of package and you see this is aluminum wire bond in order to do the, the, the testing um, this right here is a gate and this right here are the drain, the drain pads. So what I would do is I would take this device and put it in as, you know, you have gate source drain right here. Okay, the drain is this one and then you have the gate and source on, on the sides. And then you create a little rectangular plastic thing and uh, fill it up with a gel and let that gel cure to avoid uh, you know this arcing at high voltage and of course it'd be nice if you can do that in a kind of a vacuum type of environment because if you trap if you trap any bubbles inside this area air then you're going to get arcing it's going to be a problem so there are companies that are dedicated to doing packaging for wide band gap devices and there's very few of them okay and api which is now infineon is 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 one of them and these are the you know the type of modules that were that they were creating. Uh, this was I think done by by uh, PowerX. Okay, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in packaging these devices, right? One aspect is doing the design, make sure you got good fabrication, uh, decent yields. Uh, to bring the cost down. The second thing you need to do is make sure that once they're done, uh, you can package them and you can build modules that basically uh, take advantage of all the uh, favorable properties that they have. Okay, so a direct uh, silicon type of package will not allow you to do that. Okay, so I've put some of the desirable properties for uh, silicon carbide power devices. So number one is normally off operation, right? That means that in the off state, it doesn't conduct any current, okay? Which is basically what you have with the silicon power devices right now. Uh, the other thing that makes them attractive is that you have, you're able to do high voltage with a low associated resistance, right? And that's, the, that, that's basically the big advantage over silicon. Um, next thing is gate drive control. The gate drive for some of the silicon carbide devices will be different than what you have for silicon, but it has to be efficient, right? They're, they're devices that, that, that are made and they use a very big gate drive. So although the device is efficient, you're having a lot of losses in that gate drive. So you need an efficient gate drive, um, stable current sharing for easy paralleling. What does that mean? 
you're going to be working with thousands of amps, okay? A single device won't be able to do it. It's not able to do it in silicon, it's not able to do it in silicon carbide. So you got to parallel a number of devices to get the current through, right? Now, what happens is one of those devices, if for some reason starts to conduct with much lower resistance, because of the lower resistance, it will suck up more of the current, okay? And that can be a problem because that device can fail and then your whole module fail, fails. So you got to make sure that the device you design can share the current effectively, okay? That's a very, very big thing. Um, fabrication simplicity, right? Why do you want to have a simple a fabrication process that's robust and relatively simple? Because that will lead to high yields. High yields translate to low cost, and cost is everything, okay? I mean, that's what it really comes down to, the cost of these things. And then reliability, okay? You want to have something that does better than silicon, right? Okay, so you got the low resistance at high voltage, but you also want that high temperature capability to replace silicon in many applications, right? Just simplifying the cooling requirements is a huge thing. So you got to make sure that whatever device you make, you're able to test it at high temperature and it works well at that high temperature. Okay, I don't know um, if you're familiar with uh, JFET operation. You have a drain, a source, and you got a gate here. And as you apply voltage, you kind of choke this channel right here, and that's how you take your device from the on state to the off state, okay? And this is uh, basically a, a JFET in silicon carbide uh, that I've made quite a few of those over the years. And you can see the drain is here, the source is here, and this is where the current flows, and if you apply a voltage on the gates, then you know reverse voltage will increase the depletion regions and will choke off this channel, and it can close. If it closes up to 1,200, 2,000, 5,000 volt, then you got a 5,000 volt type of device. Uh, so this was back in 2006, the biggest silicon carbide uh, transistor at the time, and you can see that at about two volts on the drain, it does about 40 amps. Uh, this was the wafer with, with the devices. Um, this is the device right here, the big squares. There was a smaller device and some test structures, right? You always put some test structures on the wafer to be able to monitor your fabrication. Um, and of course, I had smaller devices because uh, the yield on those would be better. And I wanted to uh, basically uh, figure out how much I get hurt with processing and material defects, right? Now, if you look at silicon carbide or GAN or any other new material, right, you're going to make wafers, they're going to have defects, right? Because it's, it's a new type of material. And any device you put on the wafer with a defect inside, it will either fail right away, or depending on the defect, it will compromise its reliability and performance. There are certain defects in silicon carbide on the wafer that if you make a device and one of those defects is there, the device will fail outright. And then there are other defects where they make the breakdown voltage softer, and then as you keep stressing the device, as you keep biasing the device, it gets worse, worse, and worse, and then it fails. So it's a reliability issue. So especially in the early days, uh, this is 2006, right? The material was not as good as it is today. So the bigger device that you would make, the more probable that it would be that you would include uh, some sort of defect, and that was sudden death, okay? So this first um, few wafers that I had, I mean, the yield was like six and seven percent on the big devices, okay? But it was good for demonstration purposes, and it's good to say it can be done and proceed from, from there. How many devices do you think in a die on a wafer typically? Okay, so you have a wafer, mm -hmm. and the number of devices you're going to have will depend on the size of the wafer, okay? Right. In those days, we were working with three inch wafers. And then eventually, silicon carbide went to four inch, and now there's six inch wafers. Now here's the very interesting thing. Whether you process a three inch wafer or a six inch wafer, the processing fabrication cost, it's more or less the same. If it's a three inch wafer, okay, three squared is nine, and if it's a six inch wafer, it's 36. So you get four times the material with a six inch wafer at the same cost. So your price can go down four times, right? And silicon is at 12 inch. But because the material is new, you know, increasing the size of the wafer is not trivial. Yep. As you increase the size of the wafer, what you typically find is in the periphery of the wafer, 
you get a lot of the defects, right? And a lot of work is going into optimizing the quality of the material. But if you want to be competitive, you want to go to six, right? Which is what we're doing right now. We have a, a fab, an X fab in Texas that we're supporting, and they're doing fabrication with six inch, and eventually you want to go to eight inch. Right, six inch is 36, the other one is 64. You kind of double the number of devices that you get, you know, with the same cost. So, in those, how many silicon carbide applies and so on? Well, I can count them, I don't remember off the yeah, top of my head. But, uh, like no, 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 okay. no, no, it's in the hundreds. Every, okay. every one of those squares you see right here is a device because these devices are relatively big, they're not yeah. small, right? Because they're high. High voltage, uh, so you know. I think it was I think it was 128 um, on this three-inch wafer. The larger you make the device, obviously, the fewer devices you're going to get on on the wafer. Okay, so this was a 9,000 um, JFET that I um, that I had built, and you can see it's got a 100 micron drift, so a very thick drift layer, uh, good up to 9,000 volts, and um, it also has an edge termination. I might as well give you that information because we're definitely not getting to that. So you have the thickness and the doping of the layer. And there are some uh, formulas that will basically say that for this thickness and this doping, you're able to do 10,000 volts. Okay? So you make the device, well, if you don't do a net termination, you're not going to do 10,000 volts. Because this is the vertical limit, but you're going to break down around the edges of the device. Okay? So what is typically done in these power devices is at the edge of the, of the device, you put a special structure to be able to hold as much voltage as possible because there's a lot of stress at the edges and you put an edge termination to kind of spread the fields, kind of ease the fields so you don't break down at the corners. Um, you've done a good design if your edge termination, if your device captures anything over 90% of the ideal value. Okay? If you don't put the edge termination, you can build a device that's meant for 2,000 volts and you're going to break down at 500 or 600 volts or even less. And the reason I know this, um, well, I mean, it's physics, but also empirically, right, I, in the wafer, I put a device with the edge termination and the exact same device without the edge termination right next to it. So it's the same die, right, same wafer, same fabrication. I try to make it as fair as possible. Everything else is the same except the edge termination. The, the uh, ideal value was 2,200. With the edge termination, I got about 2,100, so it was a really good result. Though the guy right next to it without the edge termination, it broke down at 450. So massive, massive difference. And it's a big art how to do the edge termination uh, right. Okay, um, I want to show some other uh, JFETs. Uh, this control the channel. Um, the gate is on the top, source to drain flow. Um, there are versions where the implant sidewalls, and then, you know, there's a lot of work, or at least was a lot of work, because now the MOSFET is basically winning over, um, where you have flow, you have like some buried gates here that you open and close uh, to control the flow in the, in the transistor. And this is a trench type of, uh, of JFET, where you go through this trench. And this design is very similar to a trench MOSFET. A lot of people were looking into JFETs at the beginning because the MOSFETs have a gate oxide, and that gate oxide in silicon carbide is, is very hard to do, and a lot of work has gone into optimizing that gate oxide. So initial people would make JFETs like this, right? And the idea is, instead of having metal on the gate, when the oxide has improved, uh, you can put uh, the oxide there and you got your design to move forward. Okay, and this is a MOSFET, which is basically the, the, the workhorse, so to speak, of the, of the silicon power world. And if you talk to um, you know, a power electronics engineer and you tell them, hey, you know, we've got this new material, it's got much better properties, we can show you it's reliable and this and that, and it's you know, silicon carbide, you know, he's going to be a little apprehensive if he's not familiar with the technology. You're giving him a new type of material. Now, if you go and tell him, but guess what? It's not going to be the MOSFET that you're using, but it's going to be a JFET or a BJT or some other device, right? And you've got two new things you're going, um, you know, you're going at him with, okay? And you're going to get a lot more resistance. So the, the device that has really moved forward in silicon carbide at this point is the MOSFET. Okay, and that's a device that, that you know, is, is in production, so it's commercially available. 
and people are trying to drive it to higher voltages. And you know, a JFET and a BJT, other devices have their place, but it's going to be for more limited specialized applications. If you want to win the mass market, you know, you go and say, take out the silicon carbide MOSFET or IGBT and put a, um, I'm sorry, take out the silicon part and put a silicon carbide MOSFET or, or IGBT for, it's kind of viewed as a, as a direct um, replacement. So this is a structure of, uh, of the silicon carbide MOSFET. It's got some PN junctions to protect the gate from seeing a very high voltage because these are high voltage devices and the gate, um, if you don't protect the gate, then you're kind of limited in its operation. And there's two flavors of MOSFETs. This is the, the D MOSFET from double, doubly ionized. And you can see it's got this channel and accumulation area, so it's got this resistance. And the second version is the trench gate, which people are going to now because it's got lower resistance, okay? So you kind of eliminate uh, the channel resistance uh, since you're conducting through, through here. Um, the thing with the trench MOSFET is because it's got this trench right here, as far as voltage is concerned, this area, these corners right here, they're problematic. So you, you basically are going to reduce the resistance, right? But at the same time, you're going to reduce the voltage capability. There are a lot of uh, exceptionally smart people out there working on these things. So they're trying to take care of that problem. One thing you can do is round off the corners. That will work uh, a lot better as far as the breakdown voltage is concerned. And then some people are trying to do some sort of PN junctions to, um, you know, to protect to protect this this area. So these are these are the um, the two flavors of uh, MOSFETs that are out there. And just to give you some idea of um, of MOSFET. Um, gate operation. If you look at the silicon div um, band gap, it's right here, and this is the device of the gate oxide. Okay, so huge, huge gap, big, big gap uh, between the bands. Now, when you go to 4H silicon carbide, which is the the silicon carbide um, polytype of um, you know that's widely used, you're reducing this band gap right here. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that in the on state, okay, when you when you turn the device in the on state and the bands kind of realign, you can get tunneling from the semiconductor into the oxide. Okay, so electrons can tunnel from the conduction band into the oxide, and these electrons get trapped into the ga gate oxide, and that degrades the mobility and it creates uh, threshold shifts. Okay. So that's an issue. So uh, what you need to do, and of course it gets worse with temperature, right? Because the, uh, the band gap uh, changes. Uh, so what you need to do is in the on state, when you operate a silicon carbide MOSFET in the on state, you gotta stay below three to four megavolts per centimeter at 150C. And that also you know, kind of sets a limit to how high in temperatures the MOSFET can operate with the gate oxides that we have today, which is basically an SiO2 uh, treated in a nitrous type of environment to increase the mobility to make it higher quality, um, you're limited to about 175 uh, degree C, maybe 200. And that's why if you look into any spec sheets of MOSFET sold commercially, um, you know, the temperature of operation is about 175. That's what they uh, provide. And of course, there's an issue in the reverse bias as well. Um, from Gauss's law, the electric field that the oxide sees is the ratio of dielectric constant times the field in the semiconductor. So because of the dielectric constant uh, values, uh, that you have here, the oxides is three times the electric field of the semiconductor. So when you're in blocking mode, right, the voltage on the oxide can exceed three to four megavolts per centimeter. And you don't want to go beyond that because then there are liability issues with the, with the oxide, okay? So that kind of sets a limit and it also uh, creates opportunity for designs where people, you know, will use some sort of PN junction structures to protect the gate oxide from seeing that high voltage. So these are some considerations with respect to the silicon MOSFET because you're working in that very high voltage um, regime. And going back to history, the first uh, power MOSFET uh, made in 1995 by Palmer at Cree, which you know was a North Carolina State uh, uh, startup. And then there was a there's a very good group uh, with Professor Cooper at Purdue, and 
you know, he made the first demosfet. In those days, the decision was that the demosfet is a lot easier to fabricate than the uh, trans mosfet. So until now, people have been making uh, these types of mosfets. Now that the technology is more mature, uh, people are shifting uh, to this trans mosfet uh, just because uh, the resistance can be lower, right? And then these are typical MOSFET characteristics. This is the on state, right? You increase the gate voltage, you get higher current. And this is the blocking voltage. One thing to make a note of is when you look at the blocking voltage of a device, um, you gotta look at this curve, the blocking curve, to see if you have a soft or a sharp knee, right? If you have a soft knee, like this one here, in a lot of cases it's a lot softer, it's indication of some sort of processing or material defect. And typically devices that show a soft breakdown, in my experience, if you keep biasing, biasing them and stressing them, you get softer and softer and at some point it will, uh, it will basically, the device will basically fail. Uh, this is a MOSFET um, at the 1620 volts made by Tree. You see it's got a nice sharp knee, sharp onset of breakdown. Um, and Tree, I think, made uh, MOSFETs commercially available a few years back. So you can get them in, uh, at the 1200 volt range and the 1700 volt range. There's also Infineon, uh, who just bought Cree, that's also working on the MOSFET. I guess now they will combine their, uh, their forces. Okay, this was a MOSFET that was made uh, at North of Grammen back in 2007 where I used to work. And this was made for 10 kV. And you can see it's got kind of a softer breakdown, but it does reach, this is a very fine scale, it does reach 10 kV. And you can see, you know, your, your question uh, back there, that, you know, these devices are very, very large in order to get enough current out and they take up a big portion of the three inch uh, wafer. Okay, so moving forward, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the bipolar junction transistor, which is another uh, device in, uh, in silicon. There is a version of BJTs in, uh, in basically silicon carbide. Um, again, the device of choice and the device that people seem to want is the silicon carbide MOSFET, because they see that as a direct replacement to the silicon uh, MOSFET. Uh, but this is a you know, typical silicon carbide um, bipolar junction transistor. You have the emitter, uh, the base, the collector, and it behaves differently uh, than the uh, silicon equivalent. It's got more of a unipolar majority carrier device type of uh, behavior. Um, so it doesn't have uh, a positive temperature coefficient, meaning that if the temperature goes up, the resistance doesn't go down at the same time. Um, I won't get into any of that. It's, uh, all I'm going to say is that uh, there's an issue with the current gain. Uh, it's about 70 to 100 uh, with a lot of these uh, devices. So a current gain of 100 means what? That if you have 1,000 amps, right, you've got to have 10 amps running through your gate drive. And that's a huge amount of current to put in the gate drive. It leads to a lot of losses. So if this device is to be viable, then the current gain needs to go up uh, substantially. And um, there are a lot of issues uh, with this area right here, which could be part of what's lowering uh, the, the gain. Uh, when you do trenches in silicon carbide, right, or in any material, anytime you do a trench, you're going to create defects at the surface. So you've got to do some surface passivation to make sure that it's, you know, that you, you, you uh, basically undo the damage that, that you did. And uh, one of the ways they do that is they, you know, they, they treat the, the, you know, the devices in a nitrous type of environment to get like a more stable oxide. There's certain techniques, uh, but that's key in increasing the, the, the current gain. And there is a company called Genesic, which is a partner of um, Power America. And they make 1,200 volt devices, and you can see their gain uh, is well above a well above 100. Uh, in my mind, it needs to go up even more uh, for these devices to to become uh, competitive. Okay, next slide. Okay, so as far as transistors are concerned, for the unipolar, for the lower voltage, there is the bipolar junction transistor, the MOSFET, and the JFET. And I've put some considerations here, and this is just, you know, what I'm thinking. It's arguable. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is that way. And you talk to different people, you get different answers, especially with people working with one device. They'll praise it and see more advantages compared to others. 
Uh, but as far as the BJT is concerned, operation at a higher temperature can be an issue because as you increase the temperature, the current gain goes down. Yeah, that can be a problem. Also, current sharing, probably not so much. Uh, BJTs are have a um, positive, uh, actually negative temperature coefficient, which means you increase the temperature, resistance goes down. So when you parallel devices, that can be a problem because one device can suck up all of the current, then its resistance goes down even more. So that means it gets even more current, and you have like a runway, uh, you know, like a runaway type of current situation where will destroy the the device. Um, as far as the MOSFET is concerned, uh, operating at 300 C, which is kind of a desirable. Uh, range. The issue there is the gate dielectric. Um, you know, all the devices that are commercially available are at, are at 175, and I think some people are coming up with MOSFETs at 200, but that's kind of a limitation. You definitely want to, you know, go up in temperature to be more competitive. Um, and as far as the JFET is concerned, uh, it's not easy to make it in a normally off form. And every power electronics guy is used to working with normally off devices. If you give them a normally on device, they don't want to touch it because of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, concerns. Um, you know, if something goes wrong and it's a normally on device, current will fly right through. If something goes wrong and you have a normally off device, well, it's off, right? You're not going to have current uh, propagate. Okay, so I will I will stop right here. I had some slides on uh, on the um, on the on the diode and uh, some slides on the bipolar devices, but we're running out of time. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for being here and, and, and attending. So the main application for the MOSFETs is to replace, uh, you know, silicon MOSFETs. Uh, people see them as a one-to-one -one replacement. That's not necessarily so. You know, you gotta uh, modify the gate drive, and in a lot of cases, if you do a new topology, circuit topology, it will better take advantage of the of the MOSFET properties. But MOSFETs, you know, will go inverters into converters anywhere up to 10 kV. Now the JFETs for the, you know, they're normally on devices, uh, you know, if you're going to fabricate them efficiently. So one application for the JFETs is circuit breakers. In a circuit breaker, right, you want conduction all the time unless something goes wrong. So it's an advantage to have a device where you don't need to bias it to keep it in the on uh, state. Also, the JFET can operate at much higher temperatures. So, you know, you got the MOSFET, you, you stop at about 200. If you want to work at higher temperature, maybe you want to do a topology that will take a normally on device, and you can operate at 500C, for example. And same thing with the BJT, you know. So the idea is, you know, you want to build volume, right? You want to build volume, and that's going to happen, in my mind, through the MOSFET, because that's where most of the applications are, and that's where most of the circuit, that's the device that most of the circuit designers are willing to put into their systems. Now, once people gain confidence, in the silicon carbide MOSFET, right? And you can say, well, for this specialized application, there's this other device. Would you like to take a look at it, right? So uh, you can, you know, use those devices as well. Any other questions? So, if you look at the if you look at the people that are selling the MOSFETs, uh, they also have like a gate drive type of spice model to help you with with your circuit. If you want a 1200 volt to 1700 volt device, those are commercially available. I think that for a university graduate student type of research, you want to get the higher voltage parts that are not sold in the market, like the 3.3 kV, 6.5 kV, 10 kV type of devices, and we create topologies, circuit topologies for those. And those devices, you can get engineering samples from some places, and we're also trying to get some of those devices through our partners to make it available to people. So also in the in the in the budget period period three that's coming up, we will encourage um, you know device designers to design the high voltage devices uh, through Power America 
and the idea is that some of these devices will come back to us so we can give them to uh, people in universities. But the Freedom Center here, um, um, the Professor Subashis, uh, he basically built um, modules with uh, I think it was 10 or 15 kV parts. So you know you can find them, but they're very very limited. So they're not available. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much again.